Welcome to History and Wool. I'm Maritza Grooms. I'm here with my personal professor, Robert Forrent. <laughs> I always and love that have... title. <laughs> <laughs> it's my favorite. <laughs> and we have a special guest here today, Park Ranger, Resi Polixa. You know, I, I love to look back on the history that we've covered and what haven't we talked about. And one thing that we haven't talked about is Lowell's history of the LGBTQ plus community. And so Resi has been doing a lot of work and research on this subject. So where shall we start, Resi? I think the 19th century? Yeah, yeah, we can. Um, before we kind of dive too much into the history, I think it's really important that, you know, every time I do a program on LGBTQ history, I always start with a preface about language. I think it's really important to be mindful of. Um, so I heard someone, I forget who used the word queer before um, in our recording, which is, you know, totally fine. Um, I'm going to use that myself when I talk about the 19th century, but I want to acknowledge that in, t in this current moment that we're in right now, you know, um, the LGBTQ plus community, there's varying different opinions on the use of the word queer. Um, you know, I, and I think some of it is sort of a generational change. I see a lot of people of my generation and younger kind of really gravitating towards the word queer. Um, but there are people from like my parents' generation before who really do not want to use that word because it's been used painfully against them and offensively. Um, so, I, I use that when I talk about 19th century history, um, but I use it for a different reason. I kind of go about it from a more historical lens. Um, you know, it's really hard, I think, with any sort of community that's not the mainstream, um, there's always these changes in language that we need to be mindful of. Um, so this is kind of meta, but, you know, I think it's really important to think about for especially the LGBTQ community. Uh, queer is such a divisive term. Um, but if we go back before 1900 and the farther back we go in history, it's, it gets really hard to study LGBTQ history. And part of that is because language has changed so dramatically when the year 1900 came to pass in a way. Um, not because there was something specific that happened in 1900, it's more of like an era change, but you know, around the turn of the century, there's a lot of new, there's a new field of psychology in a way. Um, so Freud and a lot of those other people who we know start really studying people very intensely and they pay attention to sexual activity. And so that's when we get words like homosexual, that's when we get words like lesbian and gay that mean um, kind of how we understand it today. But before Freud, before his era, the words lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender did not really mean the same thing they do today. They weren't used in a widespread, commonly understood way. Um, and so because of that, since we don't really have like a common language for before 1900, that's why I use the word queer. And I always preface my programs with that because I don't know who's coming on a program. I don't know who's watching this show, um, but I don't want them to take offense by me using the word queer. I'm using it in a much more like academic way, um, not to, you know, point or take offense at anything, but. Anyway, that's where we're at in <laughs> the 19th century. Um, you know, there's, there's not really a commonly understood language for understanding the LGBTQ community, but um, I like to tell people that just because those words in that acronym did not exist doesn't mean that those experiences and those identities did not exist, those people did not exist. Um, it's just talked about in a very, very different way and it's understood very differently. Um, the way we understand gender changes a lot as well over time. And so, mm. you know, trans identities, trans experiences also don't have the same language if we go back past 1900 either. Um, so I kind of came into this field of studying LGBTQ history as someone who's interested in studying gender over time and gender history. You know, I came to Lowell because I was interested in learning more about the Mill Girls. I had learned about them in a history class and I thought that was really interesting. Um, and so I decided to apply for a job here. Um, and what's interesting about the Mill Girls is that, you know, we have an idea of what they did in Lowell. We know pretty well who the famous people are um, that work 
that wrote for the Lowell Offering and kind of led um, strikes and things like that, you know, we have names for those people. We don't have names for a lot of the mill girls though. Those, the people we know and we talk about today are kind of the exception, they're not really the rule. Um, and so when I started studying the mill girls, it was kind of difficult. <laughs> anyway, sometimes I had really great luck because you know, if you go back in time, anything before 1920 is not in copyright. So you could find it on the internet, which is pretty great. Google Books is awesome, um, you know, but the other problem is that a lot of them have very common names. Like I'm trying to search down a mill girl named Eliza Adams and there's probably 50 Eliza Adams out there, <laughs> um, more than 50, I bet. Um, and I think once the Mill Girls left Lowell, we have a very hard time tracking, you know, what they did with their lives, except for a few exceptions. Um, but for the most part, we don't know where they wound up. There's not much, you know, coverage of them, but you have to like dig super deep and kind of do research that involves travel and things like that, which is hard to do in a pandemic right now. Can I ask, yeah. can I ask a, a, a question as, a, as somebody who does research and listening to what you're describing and how difficult that can be? Is there, um, is there or are there particular sources that have been like very revelatory? Are there, th are there ways that you can sort of be a detective inside reading what young women wrote in the Voice of Industry or the Lowell Offering and like through sort of, you know, deducing language and such, you can begin to piece things together. Is that what you're describing in terms of how you're doing it? When I go into like 20th century LGBTQ history, it's a different ball game because I can look at newspapers, I can look at things that are, kind of more obvious primary sources, but mm -hmm. you know, back in the 19th century, that's not as widely digitized as it is, right? Like there's no copies of the Lowell paper in newspaper archive from the 19th century <laughs> um, in a way, you know, maybe later, but um, yeah, I think what you're describing is kind of half the battle is finding those sources in a way. Um, I tried, so when I started doing this research, I started with the most obvious person I could think of, um, kind of the most well-known mill girl is named Lucy Larkham. Because um, <laughs> I figured, you know, this is going to be an uphill battle trying to find all those sources, but Lucy Larkham is the most well-known mill girl. Um, you know, she has the park named after her that runs through the high school. You know, her words are on those sculptural pieces. That's maybe where people know her her name from. Um, but since she's the most well known, you know, it's easy to find sources about her in a way. Um, there is a biography written about her, um, you know, and there are with that biography, you can, you know, read the footnotes and see where the author got this source from. And so a lot of her papers, because she was born in Massachusetts, she died in Massachusetts, a lot of her papers are nearby. Um, actually, the Peabody Essex Museum has a lot of them because she was born in Beverly, so it's close My by. Hometown. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, the other place that has a lot of her papers is Wheaton College um, because she taught there for a few years. Um, so I didn't she, know that. Wow. Yeah, she's, she's kind of scattered in a few places, but I think those are the biggest repositories of her work. Um, you know, but she also, aside from finding these biographical sources, she also wrote a lot in her lifetime. She published a lot. She was well known in her era as a children's author. Um, she managed magazines. Um, so she had a pretty long standing literary career. Um, and so I actually kind of apply like literary analysis to stuff that I find about her, um, kind of reading between the lines of her poems to see what they could be about coupled with, you know, the biographical research, you can kind of put those pieces together and learn more about her. Um, so when she left Lowell, she, Lucy Larkin was born in Beverly, 1824, <laughs> quick bio. And then she came to Lowell um, because her mother was a boarding housekeeper at first. She didn't come to work in the mills, um, but Lucy's mother, <laughs> So Lucy's recollection was not good at managing her income as a boarding housekeeper. So she told her kids, you're gonna work in the factory now. I'm gonna take your income. Um, and so that's how Lucy got started in the factories. Um, she wrote for the Lowell Offering. Um, when she left Lowell, um, it was because her older sister, who she was very close to, um, got married and her husband wanted to move out west. So they moved to Illinois and Lucy went with her and her brother-in-law um, and kind of helped out with raising the kids. And um, eventually she got her teaching degree in Illinois and then she ended up really missing Massachusetts in the time she was away. So she came back 
Um, and I think she worked for, she worked in Lowell for a little bit. Um, and then she also taught at Wheaton um, for a while. And then eventually she stopped teaching because she really wanted to focus on her writing. Um, and so that's kind of her brief life story. Um, where it gets, where it ties to our topic today is that um, when she came back to Wheaton, um, a friend of hers was like, Lucy, I'm gonna introduce you to a friend, a cousin of mine, cause I think you need more friends. So, <laughs> so Lucy goes to meet this cousin. Her name is Esther Humiston. She lives in Connecticut. Um, they only meet once, but that was in 1858. Between 1858 and 1861, they have something called a correspondence relationship. Um, so if you read through the letters, there's a lot of love and emotion really put into that writing. Um, and so, you know, I think a lot of people today, when they think about women in the 19th century and LGBTQ culture and history, they're like, well, why aren't they just friends? You know, I think this is a very common thing where, you know, people readily accept that a male historical figure could be gay, but have trouble accepting that a woman historical figure might be not heterosexual. Um, so, you know, so whenever I tell the story, I kind of feel like there's pressure to prove it in a way, um, which is hard because Lucy and Esther, you know, they only met once, really. Um, the thing that sticks out to me, though, is after Esther dies, so their correspondence relationship lasts a few years. Esther dies in 1861. Um, so after Esther dies, Esther's mom invites Lucy to come live with her in Connecticut. <laughs> and so I'm like, you know, this wouldn't happen if they were just friends, <laughs> I feel like, um, you know, and where I found a lot of these writings as well, again, Google Books, great source, there is an edited edition of Lucy's poems, journal entries, letters um, that was published in 1895. Um, and so that's where I found a lot of these writings. I have to track down Esther's writings as well, um, which is a little harder because there's not, there's not much about her, um, you know, but that's an angle of the story that I really want to read. Um, I just haven't gotten to it yet. But in this anthology published in 1895, um, the editor has, he's, has his like editorial moments. And he, you know, he talks about, he, he reprints Lucy's writings and he has his editor comments and insight or whatever. Um, and when he talks about Lucy staying with Esther's mom, um, he's like, you know, Lucy stayed in Esther's bedroom and took the, take the place of, um, Esther in her mother's heart <laughs> or something like that, you know, very, very sentimental. Um, there's also this interesting note in the beginning of the anthology um, where the editor has his introduction and he talks about Lucy's romantic life, you know, so while Lucy was away in Illinois, um, the brother of her new brother-in-law also proposed to Lucy and she puts him off for a really long time. She's like, I'm just, I don't know what I want to do yet. Um, so I'm going to make you wait. <laughs> and, um, you know, so the editor talks about how she was proposed to, but in the end, they didn't marry. Um, and as he's talking about this, he includes a sentence, special reasons one cannot go into. <laughs> um, so, you know, again, like when you go back into the 19th century, you have to like learn to read these cues and learn to read between the lines. Um, Harriet Hanson Robinson, who's another mill girl in Lowell, is very close friends with Lucy. Um, and Harriet Hanson Robinson has a book called Lumen Spindle. Um, and sort of the starting place when I began this research is that Harriet has these brief mini biographies of 10 different mill girls um, in Lumen Spindle. So I was like, okay, well, this can give me names to go chase down and try to do research on. Um, when she writes about Lucy Larkin, she, um, she has this sentence that's like, I've been asked many times if Lucy and John Greenleaf Whittier, who's another 19th century poet, um, were more than friends. And I can honestly answer no. Um, I can, however, say Lucy was the intimate friend of the poet's sister. <laughs> um, so like language like intimate friend, romantic mm -hmm. friend, even just no adjective friend <laughs> um, can be kind of code words for um, a relationship that's more than just friendship, um, a relationship that is not heterosexually sanctioned. Um, so it's, it's really hard because you have to learn how to 
think yeah. about those words differently. Companion is another one that pops up as kind of a traveling companion. Word. Right. Yeah, exactly. you see a lot of that travel companions. Yeah, um, and then you. I mean, it's interesting with Whittier because Whittier's in Lowell editing an anti-slavery newspaper for about three years, mm -hmm. um, and I wonder if that's how their paths initially would cross. Could it would have it would have been in the same time period? Um, yeah, I think I think she actually met Whittier because he came to a Lowell offering meeting and. Um, by that point, he's like very well known. And so Lucy writes about that moment um, as like being so overcome with nerves and being starstruck at meeting this big celebrity. Um, mm. But, you know, they do start a relationship. He becomes like her writer mentor, um, mm. you know, towards the end of Lucy's life. Um, she's kind of fallen on hard financial times. And so um, John Whittier takes up a collection of their writerly friends to help Lucy out. And, you know, there's this like moment where Lucy's proud and is like, I'm not going to take your money, John. And he's like, Lucy, stop being a fool. Take this money. You need it. <laughs> um, it must take a lot of work having to be a detective, especially when I think about marginalized groups. You know, there are some groups whose histories just aren't written or they're thrown out. But mm -hmm. then especially like I'm so glad that you gave the context of the times, too. When we're thinking about the LGBTQ plus community now, every everybody, well, not everybody, but it's more accepted to be out and proud as opposed to, you know, a hundred or two hundred, even a couple of decades ago, really. Um, but can you talk more about that, like the culture there? Is there a culture that you could find in your detective work? Could you? Is there? Yeah, is there more that you could say about it? Yeah. Um... You know, I think like spaces where, spaces that are kind of single sex spaces are always spaces of, I want to, you know, think about this and look a little more into this um, kind of thing. So, you know, a big example is the Mill Girls in Lowell, um, how that was a very kind of large concentration of women in this one particular spot. Um, there is there is another mill girl who is, I kind of suspect I don't really have as much, you know, evidence backing me up with this, but um, there's another mill girl named Margaret Foley, um, who is a sculptor. Um, and she actually joins a community of expatriate sculptors who live in Italy in the 1860s. Um, and these are all women sculptors, women American sculptors who live in Italy, um, you know, and a good portion of that clique of kind of sculptors um, are women in relationships with other women. So I wouldn't be surprised if Margaret Foley had that experience herself. Um, you know, one of the more famous sculptors of that circle is named Edmonia Lewis, who is a African-American indigenous sculptor. She doesn't have ties to Lowell, but um, she is, I think, probably the most recognizable name today of that circle. Um, you know, and so there, there is kind of like emergences of, you know, or bubbles where um, these kinds of experiences are kind of commonplace and, you know, welcomed and kind of like not frowned upon necessarily. I, I think when we talk about in the 19th century too, this is another case where like the wider landscape of gender is so very different, um, you know, because when we um, think about it today as kind of historians and scholars, right? Um, you know, we don't say that these two women were gay together. Like we wouldn't say that, that's historically inaccurate because that term didn't exist. We'd say romantic friendship um, because that's the language of the time. Um, we might say Boston marriage. That's another commonly um, used term of the time too. Um, but these are all very culturally specific in a way. So Boston marriage and um, romantic friendship very much refer to experiences of white women. We don't necessarily see those contexts happening for black women, for enslaved women, for Native American women, um, you know, but those are kind of the biggest frameworks we have at the moment for understanding um, kind of the culture and a lot of theorists. Um, so I actually have this book sitting with me right here. Um, Odd Girls and Twilight Lovers by Lillian Faderman. So she's kind of the most well-known historian of um, lesbian history in a way. Um, so she posits that in the 19th century, 
non-heterosexual kind of romantic relationships were really widely sanctioned, especially for women. Um, they were often encouraged, you know, they were outright encouraged. She theorizes, um, you know, as a way for women to have a practice marriage before marrying a man. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, for a lot of women, you know, that could be that they had a romantic friendship and they're like, I'm good, <laughs> you know, I'm not gonna go anywhere else. <laughs> um, so, you know, that's, that's sort of a different climate in the way of understanding gendered experiences in the 1800s is that these relationships were not as big a deal as they became in the 20th century. So um, that's sort of a whole different landscape <laughs> in a way. And we could spend all our time on that if we wanted. There's a lot to say there. Um, but there's also a lot in Lowell too and more modern eras, more modern contexts. I mean, the history goes on and continues. So. Yeah, let's get into it a little bit more of the modern, more modern history. So yeah, um, so yeah, let's fast forward. Give sure. us some context here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, let's see. Once we get into the turn of the century, right? Um, there is kind of a big shift in how these relationships are looked at. Um, part of that has to do with psychology as a field becoming more emergent, um, right? So like Freud and a lot of people really like to evaluate um, people's experiences, sexual experiences. Um, and this is where we start to see labels come about in a way that we haven't seen before. Labels that people can like hold on to and latch onto as an identity, um, you know? So in the 19th century, there might not be labels for identity, right? Like today we have younger people coming out and saying, I am this right? That wasn't the case in the 19th century. Um, even a word like homosexual in the 19th century wasn't really used very widely. Um, but at the turn of the century with the advent of psychology, that becomes a whole different kind of new thing going on is that this is a category that we can understand. Homosexual is an identity of people that we're going to put on people who have these experiences. Um, and so there's other words I come about too. Um, something that becomes a well-known term from the book, The Well of Loneliness by Radcliffe Hall. Um, there's a term that comes out of that called invert. So um, that might be a term you see some people using um, to describe themselves if they have experiences where they're attracted to the same gender, right? They might say, I'm an invert because this means that my own gender is something different. You know, if I'm attracted to another woman, that means there's something weird with me. So I'm an invert. <laughs> um, so mm. that's a word you might see a lot. Um, so there's a whole kind of new vocabulary that comes about in this time frame, um, you know, and around this time frame, um, there's a book, oh, I'm forgetting the title, um, but there is a book that's written by someone living in New York, um, and that is about kind of an ex a trans experience that we might say, a trans experience. Um, and around this time, 1909, is when someone in Lowell named Manny Diaz is born. Um, so 1909, Manny Diaz is born. His parents are immigrants from the Azores. Um, by the time he is 11, he's starting a career. <laughs> he is starting his career as a dancer, as an entertainer. Um, he becomes very, very famous, very well known. Um, and over the course of his life, he probably performs in every venue you can think of in Lowell. Um, and one of one aspect of his performances is that he does what's called female impersonation. Um, and so that's how we might think of drag today. <laughs> um, you know, and he's not he's not um, alone in this. This is kind of a big cultural phenomenon in a way too. If you look at the Lowell Sun, there's a lot of ads for other female impersonation acts. There's actually ads for male impersonation acts too. So um, you kind of see, this is a whole genre of entertainment that's part of vaudeville um, at the time. So Manny Diaz is kind of performing in this tradition in a way. Um, you know, it, at the same time, you know, kind of the bad side of vaudeville is that there are genres like blackface coming, becoming more popular too at the same time. You know, Manny Diaz in full honesty if you look at his files at the Center for Lowell History, there are blackface photos. Um, blackface as a genre in Lowell, this is a whole separate conversation, but as a genre in Lowell goes, has a very long history and continues for a really long time. Um, you know, I've tried doing research in modern, more modern black history in Lowell, and 
you know, the, I search, you know, I kind of use the widest possible search terms when I try to do research. And when I search the term black, you know, so far a good portion of what I found have to do more with blackface than actual black people. Um, it's pretty startling. Um, you know, so, so I want to say full honesty, Manny Diaz in performing vaudeville is doing female impersonation, is also doing blackface because that is the culture he's coming to, coming up in as a performer. Um, he does have a very long tenure, long career, like I said. Um, he passed away in see, uh, 1981. You know, there's still wow. memories of him dancing, you know, in his 50s, in his 60s. Um, he has a dance school, uh, various locations in downtown Lowell, where he trains people in doing dance. Um, he performs in Boston, he performs many other locations around New England. Um, so he does have um, his drag persona. Um, I think he had two. His first one was named Juanita, and then the other drag persona he had was Chiquita. Um, so <laughs> those were his drag personas. Um, in 1950, he's actually barred from performing in Lowell, actually. And performing is his chief source of income. You know, he does have day jobs, but performing is his chief source. And what's hard is that, you know, he's barred from performing because of this female impersonation act he did as Juanita way, way back when, decades before, mm -hmm. um, you know, but he had to, he had to hire a lawyer to argue his case in court. And actually a lot of his fans called up City Hall and really advocated for him and um, kind of really pushed to change this ruling. And so at the end of nine months, Manny was able to go back to performing again. Um, in the 1950s, around the same era, there's a lot of bars around Lowell. So sort of in the area of the acre that's like Merrimack and Market Street, right past City Hall. Um, there's a lot of bars there that are frequented by kind of LGBTQ people um, at the time. Um, Manny performs in a lot of them. Um, you know, and that is a very common kind of era, if we understand LGBTQ history, we call it like the 1950s bar era. Um, Stonewall in New York, um, where Pride began in the 60s, um, was a bar, right? And so when we kind of talk about this era in LGBTQ history, LGBTQ history, we call it the pre-Stonewall era, um, you know, and so there's a lot of those bars in Loma, a lot of them are owned by different immigrant groups, there's a lot owned by the Greek community, a lot owned by the French community, um, so there is kind of this layering of history between, you know, how we understand immigrant history in Loma and the LGBTQ population interacting. And I know we're almost at time. <laughs> I talk a lot. That, no, that's great. It's yeah. really um, what you're describing is something that so gets left out of the the narrative, right? I mean, we have to do this again and try to, you know, at some future show and dig in some more on the more the more recent period. Most people will see the civil rights movement is starting in 1954 when Rosa Parks doesn't get up off, the, off her bus seat and not understand there's this long history, right? And what you've sketched for, for us now is this long history. So um, the history you're talking about doesn't happen at Stonewall in the 60s. This is an ongoing sort of fight for space, for safety, for being able to live the way you want to live. And it's an ongoing historical processes, right? And historians generally miss it. We barely scratched the surface. This is definitely going to be a part one. We'd love to have you back, Rezzy. I think that this is very compelling stuff and it's it's important history that needs to be told. And it's Lowell's history. And I think of like, now I think of like the drag brunches at Warp and Weft and, you know, just in, in our recent, like our current times. And and that's just, it's it's important. We need to keep talking about it. We need to continue this conversation. So. Thank you for bringing this information. Thank you for getting this conversation started. <laughs> Thank you for having me. This is a lot of fun. And yeah, I'm happy to come back anytime and talk more about this. It's my jam. Good. Good. <laughs> awesome. And thank all of you for tuning in. This has been History and Lowell. <laughs>